If there's one thing that Lord of the Rings fans can pretty universally agree on, it's that Samwise Gamgee is the real hero of the story, and that Viggo Mortensen broke his toe in that one scene. And Sam's heroic reputation is well earned. In both the books and movies, he embodies one of the core messages of the Lord of the Rings, that even the smallest and most humble person can change the course of the future. And yet the books and movies build this character in different ways. The differences are subtle, but they can tell us a lot about the mediums of film and literature, the way that we build stories, and why Sam is such a beloved character. At face value, Samwise Gamgee isn't anything special. In fact, it's his primary characteristic that he's just painfully average in most ways. He's not remarkably wealthy or very wise. He's not particularly brave or talented. Even his name evokes this. His first name, Samwise, comes from the old English words Sam and Wies, meaning half wise. And his last name, Gamgee, comes from Tolkien's childhood, where the term Gamgee colloquially described cotton wool. It's the Middle Earth equivalent of someone being named kinda stupid cotton ball which in retrospect would make a really good name for a rat, and I should write that down. Tolkien's Samwise was such an average name, such an English name, that in 1956, he received a letter from a rather unexpected pen pal, an actual British man named Sam Gamgee. Tolkien wrote back, it was very kind of you to write. You can imagine my astonishment when I saw your signature. I can only say, for your comfort, I hope, that the Sam Gamgee of my story is a most heroic character, now widely beloved by many readers, even though his origins are rustic." The real Sam Gamgee, of course, had not yet read Tolkien's books, and so Tolkien sent him a signed copy of the trilogy. This anecdote really epitomizes the sheer ordinariness of Sam's character. And yet, for a hobbit, all of these traits are quite desirable. Hobbits aren't supposed to be remarkable, and Sam encompasses these traits marvelously. In fact, sometimes this very stubborn pursuit of unremarkability is frustrating, even to Tolkien himself. Sam has, consequently, a stronger ingredient of that quality which even some hobbits found at times hard to bear. A vulgarity, by which I do not mean a mere down-to-earthness. A mental myopia which is proud of itself a smugness in varying degrees, and cocksureness, and a readiness to measure and sum up all things from a limited experience. So Sam is stubborn, set in his ways, and has perhaps a bit too much unwarranted confidence, so where does the heroism come in? You see, this idea of Sam as the platonic ideal of hobbitish stubbornness is only part of his story because he was also inspired by Tolkien's experiences in the First World War. The summer of 1916 forced 24-year-old J.R.R. Tolkien far out of his comfort zone, as he left his bubble at Oxford University, joining the Lancashire Fusiliers on the front lines of France. Tolkien struggled in the army for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was the teasing he experienced from older, more experienced officers. They targeted anybody who seemed like they were in over their heads, and Tolkien who was a 24-year-old nerd definitely fit this bill, and he said that he felt like they treated him like a schoolboy. The most valuable company he found at this time, then, was not with other officers, but with privates and batmen. Now, by batmen, I do not mean guys in capes, although I'm sure Tolkien and Batman would get along fine. I mean the personal assistants assigned to commissioned officers during the war. Tolkien admired their humility and their loyalty, and he remarked that they were so far superior to himself. The privates in Batman weren't necessarily wealthy, or immensely skilled, or particularly brave. They were, however, loyal to the officers that they served, and Tolkien saw how this dedication, this servitude, this loyalty elevated them into being so, so much more. Sam was directly modeled after these admirable soldiers, and this becomes crystal clear in his relationship to Frodo. Sam was cocksure, and deep down, a little conceited, but his conceit had been transformed by his devotion to Frodo. He did not think of himself as heroic, or even brave, or in any way admirable. 
except in his service and loyalty to his master. From the very beginning, this loyalty and service is on full display for Book Sam. Although he is technically sort of assigned to accompany Frodo by Gandalf, he jumps on the opportunity with vigor. He helps Merry, Pippin, and the other hobbits coordinate Frodo's escape from the Shire and seems perfectly happy to assist wherever he can. In the movies, however, Sam approaches this journey with a good bit more hesitation. He remarks that this is the farthest from home he's ever been and complains about the lack of feather beds on the road. Now in the books, there are other hobbits there to distribute this complaining amongst, and instead, Sam dedicates himself entirely to trying to make Frodo as comfortable as he can on the journey. I could take a lot more yet, sir. My packet is quite light, said Sam stoutly and untruthfully. And although we must assume that he's a little bit homesick, from pretty early on in Fellowship, we know that Book Sam is in it for the long haul. I know we are going to take a very long road into darkness, but I know I can't turn back. It isn't to see elves now, nor dragons, nor mountains that I want. I don't rightly know what I want, but I have something to do before the end, and it lies ahead, not in the Shire. I must see it through, sir, if you understand me. Thus begins Sam's linear character arc, as we watch loyalty and service take him from being a humble gardener to a true hero. In an essay exploring this journey, Charles Nelson proposes that Sam's journey is reflective of that of the traditional tale of the squire. Squires appear throughout history and storytelling tradition, but especially in the Arthurian myths that Tolkien was so fond of. It was the squire's duty to look after and care for the noble knight, acting as a sidekick, comic relief, and a very loyal servant. Squires weren't selected because of their wealth or their skills. Instead, they were chosen for much deeper traits, things like loyalty, honesty, and humility. Although they don't start the story out as heroes in their own right, especially when you compare them to the lordly knights that they serve, by the end, the story proves that their goodness, the quality of their character, is the thing that makes them truly heroic. The squire was frequently placed in a subservient position, in which he gradually took more and more responsibility, while learning that, in doing service, he was achieving humility, and that, in achieving humility, he was approaching the ideal of knighthood. This arc, one that Tolkien would have been very familiar with, is echoed in Sam's story. He sets his marks early, not trying to be a hero, but trying to be a good servant, a good friend, and a good squire to the heroic Frodo. Sam of the movies does not have such a straightforward journey ahead. Rather than following the medieval storytelling path of establishing his traits early on and using the external forces of the story to forge him into a hero, movie Sam's journey is far more emotional, more volatile. His change is not external, the world proving him worthwhile, but internal, Sam proving to himself that he is worthwhile. While Book Sam is pretty much locked in from that point where they first meet the elves in the woods, ready and willing to go on this whole journey, Movie Sam is still thinking about returning home even once they've made it to Rivendell. He tells Frodo that they did what they came to do and he's ready for the return journey. He isn't really fully committed until the end of Fellowship when he stops Frodo from leaving for Mordor alone. This scene does also happen in the books, but the tone is very different. In the books, Sam's insistence comes from the same place that most of his choices do, undying loyalty to his master. Of all the confounded nuisances, you are the worst, Sam, said Frodo. Oh, Mr. Frodo, that's hard, said Sam, shivering. That's hard, trying to go without me and all. If I hadn't a guest right, where would you be now? Safely on my way. Safely, said Sam, all alone and without me to help you? I couldn't have borne it. It'd have been the death of me. In the films, I believe Sam's choice here to have been made with far more emotion. The wound of Gandalf's death is still quite raw, because time moves differently in movies and books, and when Frodo rescues Sam from drowning, he's not saying, oh, I can't believe you'd try to go off without me because it's not safe. He's sobbing because he doesn't want to break his promise to the now deceased Gandalf. He quotes Gandalf, Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee, and I don't mean to. 
That's not to say that the motivation of the books, loyalty to Frodo, isn't present in Sam's decision making here. It's just a pivot in tone that arises naturally as a result of adaptation. In a book, we have characters. We see their dialogue, we see their internal monologue, we build and shape this character up in our minds out of words printed on paper. But a film has the unique challenge and privilege of working with real people. And that's why reading a screenplay is a very different experience than seeing a screenplay performed, because putting these words from a page into an actor's mouth imbues them with an unmistakable humanity that you just don't get from the printed word. A script put in the hands of an actor doesn't just create a character, it creates a person. And the way that that person feels, the way they act, will always be different. And this seems to be a problem, or at least a conundrum, that the writers of The Lord of the Rings were willing to tackle head on. In an interview, screenwriter for The Lord of the Rings, Philippa Boyens, explains that their adaptational process involved trying to find real sentiment in the books. She says that their goal was to tell these stories as if they were real, find the honesty in it, so that it is real sentiment, not sentimental, that it's not manufactured emotion. When you take into account these goals, especially when contrasted to Tolkien's goals, the changes in Sam's character arc make a lot of sense. We have the novel, a storybook-like structure in which a character's loyalty is put to the test and proven to be true heroism. And the movies, where an insecure hobbit is taken out of his comfort zone and made brave by the power of love. These changing arcs come to a head in Frodo and Sam's long journey alone through Mordor. One conversation in particular epitomizes these differences. Sam says, I wonder if we shall ever be put into songs or tales. And people will say, let's hear about Frodo and the ring. And they'll say, yes, that's one of my favorite stories. Frodo was very brave, wasn't he, Dad? Yes, my boy, the famousest of the hobbits, and that's saying a lot. Why, Sam, Frodo said, to hear you somehow makes me as merry as if the story was already written. But you've left out one of the chief characters. Sam Wise the Stout-Hearted. I want to hear more about Sam, Dad. Frodo wouldn't have got far without Sam, would he, Dad? Now, Mr. Frodo, said Sam, you shouldn't make fun. I was serious. So was I, said Frodo. In the movies, this conversation is recited nearly word for word, except for one key phrase. You've left out one of the chief characters, Samwise the Brave. In the books, this line reads, Samwise the Stout-Hearted. In the movies, it is Samwise the Brave. This particular point is I will admit, probably gonna get me called nitpicky in the comments, but I mean, it's a Lord of the Rings channel, I'm not really sure what you were expecting. But the subtle difference in these word choices is fascinating. Stout-hearted is a word that sounds very grand. It's not something we use a lot in our everyday speech unless you talk like a medieval lord, but it implies a very, a very internal resolve, a steadfastness. Brave, however, is all about the outward show. It almost allows for more internal turmoil, more conflict, but notes that the outward showing, the outward actions, were brave. They were courageous. But beyond just nitpicking, Peter Jackson made some pretty major changes to this part of Frodo and Sam's story. While Frodo and Sam of the books remain unwaveringly loyal to each other, no matter what they go through, the relationship of Frodo and Sam in the movies is much more tumultuous. As they're scaling the steps of Kirith Ungol to Shelob's lair, the manipulation of the ring and Gollum get the best of Frodo. Gollum frames Sam to try and get rid of him and accuses him of eating the rest of their food supply. And when Sam offers to take the ring for a little while to relieve Frodo of the burden of it, Frodo snaps and orders Sam to return home alone. Heartbroken by this rejection and seeing no other way forward, Sam turns away and leaves. This was one of the most controversial changes made in the movies, and I'm not gonna pretend that I love it. Even outside of characters, just from a logical point of view, what exactly does Frodo think Sam is going to do here? He can't just go home. He has no food because apparently he's eaten it all and they needed Gollum's guidance to get there in the first place. So he's probably just gonna get lost and die of starvation. Besides, Sam has been nothing but 
utterly dedicated to Frodo through this entire journey, including not eating on multiple occasions so that Frodo would have enough to go on. Why would he suddenly flip the script and go cookie monster mode on the last of the Lembus bread on this random day? It's unrealistic on multiple levels, because while Frodo probably would not have any reason to send Sam away, it's even less likely that Sam would actually listen and leave. Frodo already tried to get rid of him once at the end of The Fellowship of the Ring and had to admit, it's no good trying to escape you. It is plain that we were meant to go together. And yet, that is the book version, and I do admit I see a little bit of the reasoning for why Sam would actually leave for the movie version of his character. For Sam, who suffers from self-confidence issues and negative self-talk, this is his worst nightmare. Frodo, his best friend, who he has pinned all of his self-worth on, all of his delicately fostered and growing confidence shatters his trust entirely by believing Gollum. It's a confirmation of Sam's worst fears, that he's not enough, that he never will be enough. He leaves not because he's upset with Frodo for not trusting him, but because he's upset with himself. In the books, however, this moment of utter misery comes a little bit later. After Sam has bravely defeated the spider monster Shelob, he turns and finds Frodo seemingly dead. He spirals, not knowing how he's gonna have the motivation to go on. He wonders if his rage towards Gollum and his betrayal will be enough to fuel him and even considers taking his own life. These differing character climaxes can tell us a lot about the stories that they belong to. In the movies, the conflict is internal. It is within the relationship between Frodo and Sam. The pain of this lowest moment comes from the conflict in their relationship. In the books, however, this conflict is external. Their relationship is solid, firm, totally fine. It's the outside world that is throwing the curveballs at them. And I think that this is reflective of the audiences that these stories were written for. Tolkien's audience was more or less himself. He wrote stories that he would enjoy in the way that he enjoyed them. This means that his mode of storytelling is old-fashioned. It evokes stories of the past, especially medieval storytelling. However, this mode of storytelling is outdated. It's not how most modern stories are told. Modern audiences have come to expect some kind of conflict in relationships. You need to propel these characters apart so that their reunion, their making up, is all the more satisfying. A story where two characters are good friends that remain true to each other and good friends through an entire three-hour movie simply is not the norm for Hollywood, and definitely was not the norm for Hollywood in the early 2000s. Still, both the books and movies manage to navigate the character out of their dark night of the soul and have them come out all the stronger. In the movies, Sam discovers blatant evidence of Gollum's meddling, and this is enough of a system shock that he turns back. He has confirmation that Frodo is in danger, and even if he's not the right or the best man for the job, he's also the only man there, so he's gonna have to do something. The fire of his emotions bursts through the dams of his insecurity, allowing him to act truly heroic. In the books, Sam learns that Frodo isn't actually dead and has to face his fears and take the burden of the ring himself as he goes to rescue Frodo. And in this case, it isn't fiery emotion that allows him to prevail, but his inherent hobbitish qualities. In that hour of trial, it was the love of his master that helped most to hold him firm, but also deep down in him lived, still unconquered, his plain hobbit sense. He knew in the core of his heart that he was not large enough to bear such a burden. Sam's unfailing humility and hobbitishness is the thing that allows him to resist the temptation of the ring and save Frodo. The end of Sam's character arc plays out pretty similarly in both the books and movies. Sam carries Frodo up Mount Doom, and once the ring is destroyed and Gollum is dead, they're both left absorbing the aftermath. And the books are able to explore Sam's very complicated feelings about this through internal monologue. Well, this is the end, Sam Gamgee, said a voice by his side. And there was Frodo, pale and worn and yet himself again. And in his eyes, there was peace now. Neither strain of will nor madness nor any fear. His burden was taken away. There was the dear master of the sweet days in the Shire. Master, cried Sam and fell upon his knees. In all that ruin of the world, for the moment he felt only joy, 
great joy. The burden was gone. His master had been saved. He was himself again. He was free. The movies are tasked with carrying this exchange, this internal conversation, with a mere glance. Once again, highlighting how very different the mediums of literature and film are. While the books can explore this complex emotional journey of navigating the fact that everything is lost and you might die, but also you've won, you know, navigating the role that fate has played in your story and concluding that you are happy to be together in the end, the characters of the movie need to express this externally, weeping in each other's arms as they mourn everything they've lost and everything they've saved. Still, both of these scenes come to the same conclusion. I'm glad to be with you, Samwise Gamgee. Here at the end of all things. If anyone ever tried to contest the importance of Sam's role in the narrative, the end of the novel makes this impossible. When the hobbits learn that Frodo is going to be leaving Middle-earth, Frodo explains, I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger, someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. But you are my heir. All that I had and might have had, I leave to you. Your hands and your wits will be needed everywhere. You will be the mayor, of course, as long as you want to be, and the most famous gardener in history. And you will read things out of the Red Book and keep alive the memory of the age that is gone, so that people will remember the great danger and so love their beloved land all the more. And that will keep you as busy and as happy as anyone can be, as long as your part of the story goes on. Frodo has all along been our hero our night. We've watched him be buffeted about by the forces of evil, strained to his very limit, and come out damaged but victorious. Frodo is admirable, he is incredible, but in the end he is not the one that Tolkien is calling us to emulate. It is in Sam that we find our true audience surrogate. Just like Sam, we, the readers, are the ones who are left behind. We are left to spread the word, to keep the memory of the story alive, recalling it for all of its pain and all of its beauty. Through Sam, Tolkien shows us what he believes us to be capable of. We don't need to come into this wealthy or noble or heroic. The power of story takes our most base and core traits, things like loyalty, pride, stubbornness, and love. It takes the things about us that are plain, that are ordinary, and tells us that they can be truly heroic. He shows us that we don't need to be the knight, we don't need to be the big hero. We can be something better. We can be the survivors, the ones who are made whole by the story. And despite the differences in the journey to get us there, the Sam of the movies tells us a very similar thing. Sam's self-degradation and lack of confidence are put to the test in the end, when they're back in the Shire, and Mordor and Gollum and the Ring are nothing but a bad memory. In his final act of truly inspired bravery, Sam is bold enough to go and talk to the girl that he loves. This simple act is reflective of a much larger change in Sam's character. His arc has taken him from someone that is good, but troubled, to someone that is good and is strong enough to know that he is good. In their own unique ways, both stories manage to preach the same message. You, in all of your plainness, all of your hobbitishness, are enough. Sam's character and the adaptation of this character is really a lesson in subtlety and intent. As opposed to some other characters in the trilogy, I don't think that Peter Jackson and Philippa Boyens approached this character thinking that they were going to change it dramatically. Rather, he took what Tolkien had given him and molded it shaping it to fit the new story that he wanted to tell. No adaptation is perfect. In fact, I think the idea of a perfect adaptation is kind of just a false promise. But some stories and some creators have enough love and understanding of the source material that they create magic all the same. As always, it's kind of impossible for me to say which of these characters I like more but it's possible that Movie Sam wins this one by a very thin margin, just because I, I personally really connect to his journey, and Sean Astin's performance is just incredible. He's so great, and I cry 
so much when I watch him, but I would be very curious to see what you guys have to say in the comments. This video is made not really for Tolkien Reading Day, but kind of in recognition that that is coming up, and I believe the theme this year is self-sacrifice and service, so I thought this video would be kind of fitting, but that is coming up on the 25th, so be sure to tune into all of your favorite Tolkien channels, because I'm pretty sure a lot of people are doing something for Tolkien Reading Day. As you may be able to tell, my studio has experienced a wee bit of redecoration with the very helpful advice of my patrons, but it's still a work in progress, so let me know what you guys think. Give this video a like if you learned something, because it really helps me out, and consider subscribing, because there is over a hundred thousand of you and I am creating an army! Or just so that you don't miss the uh, videos about Tolkien and other stuff that I post every week. That's a good reason too, but... Thank you so much for tuning in this week and every week, and I hope that you have a very happy hobbity day.